our guest speaker today. So I'm going to be recording here in one moment. Okay, so thank you all for joining us this afternoon. I am so excited to have Lynn Hyde here with us. She was sharing uh, with me some of her background and where her roots are from and where she has planted uh, some new roots right here on the West Coast. And I'm so excited to hear her presentation on the Haller House and learn more about uh, a historic building as well as her passion for the historic buildings of the reserve. So. Uh, Lynn, if you'd like to expound any more on that, we would love to hear from you. All righty. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really excited about it, and I'm happy to see old friends. And and I'm looking at old friends thinking, how can they possibly sit through another one of these, <laughs> listening to me drone on? But because you all know, I'm very wordy, and I don't know when to shut up. So um, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna try to not. Um, uh, not go down the rabbit holes that I usually go down, uh, especially because you guys know a lot of stuff already. Um, this is a presentation that I um, have given to other organizations where the audience isn't as um, well versed as you guys are. So um, if I if I if it looks like I'm just going through slides and you want to go, hey, wait, stop. It's just um, probably because I know you know this stuff already, but we'll see. So um, I will share a screen and. Let's see if we can't start the show. And please uh, feel free to blurt out any questions as I'm going. You don't have to wait till the end. Um, and I hope that not too much um, is hidden by the tiles on the on the right hand side of the screen or wherever they go. All right. So um, the Hallers in their house. Um, I always like to start with this one because I don't think the house ever looked more pathetic <laughs> than it did when it was up on the blocks with its windows all boarded up. But um, you know, for for those of us who love old houses, uh, it's it is an act of love and imagination. And so when I look at the house, even when it has looked like this, it didn't look like this to me. It looks like this to me. You know, there's bluebirds and butterflies and, <laughs> and joy all around. Um, this uh, this uh, artist's uh, sketch from back in 2015 or 16 um, shows our grand plans for the building. And you know, one of the things that philosophically I feel about old houses is that they're all really just um, they all have stories, and they are all books that are closed sitting on a shelf. Um, and all you have to do is open the door and sit down, have a good read. Uh, and that's what makes us do crazy things uh, like historic preservation. Um, the great thing about Coopville and about EB's Reserve is that it's a whole library of these books um, that are hardly ever tapped into. Um, Front Street in particular um, is one place where you can really get that concentrated effect of how these old buildings really take you back in time. And uh, the Central Whidbey Island Historic District, of course, is the basis for EB's Landing. So there is your uh, part of your library. And, um, um, but as you know, it's all over the reserve where these houses are really terrific. Um, there's probably over 400 buildings, I think, still in the contributing inventory for the reserve. But the ones that um, we are really um, most excited about preserving are what we call the territorials. And these are the houses that were built before. Um, uh, 1873 or 1874 when the railroad comes and um, it's not really once the railroad comes uh, it's well basically to be blunt dispossession is over um, the land is pretty well taken over and so it's it's already a set generation of people that are living out here by the 1870s so um, some of the really the best uh, houses that you're probably familiar with um, in chronological order, the Fairhaven cabin up um, on the walk to the town park uphill from the museum, um, Thomas Coop House, which has since this photo gotten a nice new coat of paint thanks to uh, an EB's field school. Um, the old courthouse, everybody knows, 1855, a building I don't have to tell you anything about. Um, this uh, Grand Dame, anybody know which one this is? Harrison, you don't count. <laughs> Harrison, 
it's this is the um the uh william engel um house where flora pearson lived uh you probably don't know it because you can't see it anymore it's in the middle of a jungle and it looks more like this even if you can get in front of the house so this is a the house that is very much on our radar for uh, future trouble. Okay, whoop, go back. Ah, ah, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> All right, you guys know this one. Don't need to tell you about it. This is the um, Samuel Libby house up in Sierra, uh, surrounded by development now, but uh, built in 1860. Same year as the Walter Crockett house. Um, 1864, John Robertson's house and Toby's 1866. So if you are walking down Front Street and you go by what used to be the Mad Crab, the blue building um, where the Laughing Admiral is now, there's a plaque on there that says it was John Robertson's store, 1866. Um, it's actually um, on the wrong building. It should be on Toby's. Toby's building sa says eight, 1870 something, but that actually belongs to somebody else too. So uh, we're always learning about our mistakes in, uh, in the historic chronology of our buildings. Uh, the Haller House is one of the, at least part of the Haller House is one of the earliest because the back wing there, the Brunn House, was a plank frame cabin that was built in 1859 by Raphael Brunn. Um, and it was uh, seven years before the front part of the house, the big, beautiful colonial uh, Haller house was added to it. Um, so uh, you might notice there's a third little um, uh, building off the back of it. We're not exactly sure when that disappeared, but it was certainly gone by the turn of the 20th century. That is, this is the oldest picture we have of the house. Um, and we know that it was taken before 1876, probably. And that is, um, that is uh, Colonel Haller on the steps coming out. So it's a good vintage photograph. This is the house take it. This picture was taken somewhere between 1876 and 1878. And they have added Henrietta Haller, the lady of the house was an avid uh, horticulturist and gardener. And um, uh, she had uh, her, her, she had her husband, uh, build out a conservatory for her to keep her plants and we are if you've been near the property at all you might see that when we poured a foundation for it a year and a half ago that we did pour a foundation for um, rebuilding the conservatory so we are right now hoping that we will have our our permits um, and certificate of appropriateness all in line by the end of this month so that we can start building the conservatory in April. So we're really, really excited about that. We've got the money sitting there waiting to spend and are just waiting on the paperwork. So to give you, this is one of the older shots we have of town and this is 1884 taken from the water. And I'm gonna zoom in so that you can see what used to be Haller's complex. It was actually, um, well, 1884, the Hallers have already moved away. They moved away in 1879. Um, but this is what it looked like when he was living there. So the Haller house is there, the Brunn cabin is there behind it. And then this is the only photograph we have of the original mercantile store, which was built by Raphael Brunn uh, and then run by the Hallers. Brunn also built, um, the wharf in the background, not the wharf in the front, but the wharf in the background and the warehouse there. And um, we've come to learn recently that when Brunn built those between 1861, there was almost nothing else on the street at all. It definitely was the first wharf in Coopville because up until 1860, it was still an active Indian village. So what you would have seen, Front Street would have been just a dirt path that ran between Thomas Coop's house over by Captain Coop Park and um, John Alexander's house, which is where the museum is now. And the only houses in between those two points would have been the Brunn house. And you can see it to the left here, um, the Thomas Dow house. So there were only four streets by 1861, or four uh, buildings in 1861, uh, houses, I should say, because the mercantile was there too. So it was pretty sparse. It was just a path through the woods uh, and still um, native people living on the beach. So it's pretty exciting to think that um, our little Brunn cabin in the back is really where um, Coopville's commercial life uh, started, was here on this spot. 
This is another view uh, looking downhill, uh, the Haller House and the Brunn House on the right. Um, Aqua has just been built, if it's finished yet, and the Glenwood Hotel is almost done. So we date this somewhere between 1889 and 1890. And you can see there is no mercantile. Um, and that is because Island County decided to widen the street and to do so they had to cut the store in half and remove it, driving the uh, businessman who was running it out of into bankruptcy. So yay for the government. And um, we expect it was the same time around that time because Aqua is there, that is where the wharf, Bruns Wharf would have run into the into the um, bluff. So the wharf and the warehouse that Raphael Brun built was down at, at the time that they built Aqua. So changes already in 1889. This picture is from uh, the 1930s. It's a detail from a water festival shot. And now you can see there's a new mercantile building. The Haller House is in the center. And then the big thing that's with the um, with the flag banners, that is was a new uh, commercial store. Sometimes it was a furniture store. Sometimes it was a mercantile. But by the 1930s, it was the movie theater. And you can see the projection booth sticking out over the sidewalk on the second floor. This was taken maybe a little bit earlier than that. So I'm, my chronology is off, I'm sorry. Telephone poles are up. It's probably the 1920s here. And this is the Haller's backyard. You can see the conservatory there on the left. And um, the land had not been terraced yet the way it is now. Uh, and the third component there is already gone. So you can kind of see because it's winter, the bones of an orchard and gardens that the whoever lived in the house, at least until the mid 19th or the mid 20th century was using that all the way back to 9th Street as part of their, um, their town garden. And that's something we would like to see um, garden once again, going from the back of the Haller House all the way up to 9th Street, if we can get people to agree with us. <laughs> So why is the house special besides the fact that it's old and it's where the, um, where the commercial life of Coopville started? Well, it's the people who built the Haller section of the house. Haller was, um, he was all over the place during the territorial era. He and his wife, uh, his wife was actually a, um, a, an aristocrat um, of an English family living in Ireland. So she grew up in Ireland um, in a family, an, an aristocratic family that was down on its financial luck. Her mother was an American from York, Pennsylvania. And when Henrietta uh, came of age, she went to join her mother in York and that just happened to be Granville Haller's hometown. So that is how an aristocrat ended up following a soldier all around the West in Indian country. And um, so the adventures of these two people in the territorial era of Washington is what makes the house really special. Um, people often ask us, why do you wanna celebrate? You know, Why do you wanna preserve the house of an Indian killer? Um, it's not a monument to Granville Haller. It's not a monument to westward expansion or manifest destiny. It's the incredible um, chronicles of stories of what they witnessed, what they wrote about it, Haller was self-educated and uh, very literate, and he left writings about everything that he went through. So he gives us a really good window on in Washington Territory in the 1850s, especially, um, and into the 60s as well. So most of you have seen me do this little dog and pony show, and this is where I just like to show why Penn Cove was such a hugely significant place to native people here. Um, but to really get a, a handle on it, you have to, you have to get off the, the uh, Western uh, compass face. Uh, if you turn it just 90 degrees, all of a sudden you can see those waterways, not just, um, not just the three saltwater arms of the Salish Sea, but also the rivers, the, the three major rivers that make trade um, so uh, possible and fruitful with uh, tribes on the east side of the mountains because uh, transport over these mountain passes, three major rivers dumping on the east side of Whidbey Island. So it's, um, it could not be uh, any more an epicenter of Coast Salish life, uh, Penn Cove, great place. 
for all tribes. So the you guys know most of this too, but I'll quickly just talk about what I find most fascinating about the territorial era or the late 18th and, and early uh, to mid 19th century here is that this is such a convergence of different cultures. It's not just Americans and Coast Salish people. It's American, well, it's Coast Salish people in their homelands in the, in the, uh, aftermath of the war of 1812 the hudson the british start to set up shop um, all over western washington um, in 1843 they're forced to move their fort vancouver operations to fort victoria but what this does is it the british coming into the area make it um, much more of a destination place for tribes from all over all the way up into southeast alaska so that creates good times and it creates bad times. But for the most part, the had a very positive relationship with most of the native peoples because, well, in the Northwest tribal cultures and economies, what your status was in your wealth. So very much, uh, <laughs> very much like uh, uh, Westerners, uh, the, more, the more material wealth you had, the higher your status was. Uh, and so all these Europeans setting up trading posts um, made, uh, made the Salish Sea a real destination for uh, native people from all over. So it brought a lot of um, tribes from British Columbia, Southeast Alaska. Uh, it increased trade from the Columbia, Columbia River Basin on the east side. Um, and then finally the Americans come in. So, you know, Plateau peoples and Coast Salish peoples have very different cultures and languages. Uh, same is true with the Northern Indians coming from, from up, up over the border. So uh, there's, those are the three native uh, cultures and the two European cultures that are all coming together and trying to um, reach different goals here in, in our little area. So, um, I, I want to just briefly show you where Haller was during the 1850s. He's actually not on Whidbey Island very often. So um, he is, the stories that we'll be telling are really stories of the whole territory when we're talking about Haller, with, with a few exceptions. Um, the yellow dot on Whidbey is really where Haller was located and uh, active as a civilian uh, after, um, after the Civil War uh, and beyond. But uh, if whether he was uh, fighting with uh, Plateau Indians in the east or um, trying to run down war canoes of northern raiders uh, mm -hmm. up, uh, up in the straits, he was getting around all over the place. He started out his first stop in 1854 was the Vancouver's barracks. And for any of you who have not been to Fort Vancouver, um, you have to put it on your list, National Historical Park. It's the, I think the first exit on the north side of the Columbia River. Uh, and the, the, great, um, the great thing about that particular spot is there's really two parks in one because they have um, restored the Hudson Bay Company fort that it was originally. And then after the British, after the, tree, after the boundary was settled in 1849 and they moved up to Fort Victoria, then the US Army really expanded. So you've got, a, you've got an 1850s Army fort and a Hudson Bay Company fort. You get two parks for one. It's uh, more bang for your buck. It's great. Uh, and of course it's free, so. <laughs> um, and also while I'm on Fort, um, uh, Hudson Bay Company parks, if you haven't been to the Fort Nisqually Living History Museum in Point Defiance Park, it's not a national historical park, but it's one of the premier living history museums. Um, on the West Coast, if not nationwide. Uh, and they do a really great program of the early 19th century when the fur traders were there. So uh, they were shortly sent off to Fort Dalles uh, on, along uh, the Oregon Trail. And uh, that was on the Oregon side of the Columbia River. Um, I always include this. It gives you a really great idea of our fallen aristocrat, Henrietta Haller, and, and how she was really game for a life of adventure. Uh, she writes home to her family living out on the on the desolate prairies of eastern Washington. I spend most of my time with the children, the cow and the calf, the pigs and the chickens. We're not concerned with the Indians about our children. I keep them close to the house because of the snakes. <laughs> Just another day for an aristocrat in the Washington Territory. 
Haller, meanwhile, was getting in all kinds of trouble starting the Yakima Wars. Uh, and I won't, um, I won't bore you with the long story there, but um, um, attempting to get, there had been a, a murder amongst the Yakima of, a, of a, an Indian agent of the Washington Territory. And um, so he and his men were sent to treat with the Yakima to have them produce the culprits because, you know, and often those attacks on settlers were not tribal affairs. They were rogue, um, usually young men who took uh, matters into their own hands. And so it, it wasn't uncommon for the tribes to deliver um, uh, bad actors for uh, army justice. Uh, Haller hoped that it would be a smooth uh, transaction, but uh, it was not. He had a little over a hundred men. And by the time he was surrounded, there were about 1500 warriors that were um, having their way with them. Um, uh, by traveling at night, they uh, made a three-day running retreat back to the Dalles, uh, but it re what it did is it emboldened the Yakima and all the Eastern Plateau tribes that, oh, this U.S. Army, it's not that hard to beat. <laughs> we can get them with numbers. Uh, and so it really launched a series of battles and um, skirmishes that went on for the next few years, uh, all in the aftermath of the signing of the treaties which as you know, didn't go over well with the tribes either. Is that right? No. Uh, okay. So um, I, I put up a picture of Chief Kamayak and he was the leader of the Yakima during all this. Uh, Haller had uh, a lot of time out there before the battles to um, get to meet some of these chiefs. And he had a tremendous amount of uh, admiration for them. Um, I won't, I won't read the whole thing, but he felt that Kamayakin um, should take rank with the most eminent chiefs of the Indian. Uh, he was keen, farsighted and resolute, most bitterly opposed to the encroachments of the white man. Um, his people were told they must give up lands where they had lived their infancy and manhood, and it was more than they could bear. He, like Leshai of the Nisqually, were great patriots in their own right, defenders of their people and their very way of life. He um, was ex extremely judicious with the Yakima in particular, um, felt really sorry for them as well as Leshai of the Nisqually. Um, uh, but he also thought that, you know, Western, West, Western civilization was gonna come whether they liked it or not. He did not like the way that many of the settlers treated the Indians and um, felt that many, many in the army felt that their job was as much to protect the Indians from the settlers as the other way around. Um, and if any of you missed it and are interested in seeing it um, from our website, we had last summer um, a speaker, a Yakima woman, a member of the Yakima tribe who's an independent scholar who um, is very interested in the Yakima Wars from uh, telling it from both sides. And she gave a, an hour long presentation to us on Zoom. And if you are interested in seeing it, um, you can go to historicwoodby.org uh, and go into updates and you will find Emily Washings in there. Um, it was a really interesting presentation. Um, uh, likewise, he felt that um, Leshai, who you may know was hung by, um, by civilian, white civilian, the legislature, not the army, but the legislature um, uh, hung him for murder uh, during wartime. Um, and Haller and most of the army officers were very much opposed to this execution because they felt that he was a war combatant, not a murderer, uh, and that he um, was being maltreated. Um, back here, while that's all going on in the mid 1850s, um, you guys all know, uh, know the boundaries on this map. You probably know where our main villages were out at Snakeland Point and um, Coopville and Monroe's Landing. You know where EB's Landing is, where EB had settled in 1850, and you know where Coveland is. So there's not a lot of news for, <laughs> for you here, except for one little thing that we don't often hear about. Um, if you've read Doug Doerr's um, study for the National Parks about um, the Skagit of Penn Cove, then you will know about this, which is the formation uh, in the aftermath of the treaties of um, special Indian, Indian agencies all over Western Washington. And the Penn Cove Special Indian Agency was um, uh, centered uh, just um, 
just northeast of where um, um, Coveland was located. And uh, at this time, at the from what Dewar reports there, uh, and uh, Agent Robert Fay, Captain Fay, reported at the at its largest, there were nearly twenty, nearly three thousand Native people living on the beaches of Penn Cove. And um, this is really, I used to think of it as a refugee. I apologize, Lynn. I accidentally muted you there. <laughs> I was getting <laughs> rid of the feedback yeah. and I hit everyone. <laughs> I, I had students that would have loved to have been able to do that when I was a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I was listening to a panel um, of Native people down uh, during a program that Fort Nisqually ran, and there was a woman from um, from the Tulalip tribe, and she said these special in Indian agencies were no different from internment camps. So if, if you stop to think of it as, um, you know, a Minidoka, a little Minidoka right here on Penn Cove, because these people were forcibly removed from their homes. Uh, in the foothills of the Cascades, uh, primarily because the fear was that they would ally with the Yakima Indians on the eastern side, and that they would all together band and um, descend upon the settlers uh, on Puget Sound. So um, from 1855 to till the time uh, Congress ratified the treaties and set up the reservations. So maybe a five or six year period, there were people under Robert Fay's charge on Penn Cove that were not um, uh, native. Uh, uh, well, they were native, but they weren't Skagit people who had always lived there. They were people that had been brought down from the Snohomish and the Stillaguamish and all over the foothills. Um, and then, of course, at the same time, all that trade had attracted um, great ships full of northern Indians, which you guys all know about because you all know about Isaac Eby. And Isaac Eby wasn't killed by local Indians. He was killed by Indians from southeast Alaska from Cake. So the threat of these northern Indians was really enormous. And um, where was Haller in all this? Well, after he started the war in the east, <laughs> I think they wanted to get rid of him. <laughs> they sent him out. They sent him and they sent Captain George Pickett, who would later have um, some bad luck at Gettysburg, to establish forts uh, on Puget Sound or on, on, the, on the coast to um, help monitor the, the uh, waters and protect the, the local settlements from depredations of these northern raiders. Um, Captain Pickett was uh, sent to establish uh, Fort Bellingham up in Whatcom and uh, Major Haller was sent to Port Townsend to establish Fort Townsend, which is, uh, there's none of it left now, but there, there is a state park where it used to be. So he was pretty close by. And so that put him in touch with residents of um, Whidbey Island all the time. For example, um, uh, he fed his army on uh, beef and um, produce that he contracted with um, um, Isaac and uh, Winfield Eby. So there was a lot of communication. Uh, Haller became friends with the Ebys through those business transactions. Um, and then uh, because the fear of Northern Indians was getting more intense all the time, he made an appeal to his superiors down at Fort Stillicum that a large number of highly respectable citizens who have settled on Whidbey, Whidbey's Island um, have accumulated considerable property, stock, et cetera, which with the valuable improvements on their claims would be much exposed to the depredations of the Russian and British Indians in the event of a descent. I love that because the Russians and the Brits get to have the blame for Northern Raiders <laughs> as if they were theirs. Um, and uh, anyway, the, um, the goods, all the good loot that the settlers had might tempt Northern Indians to plunder the island. Um, so he thought that there was a, uh, there needed to be action taken by the military because uh, the locations of troops at Bellingham Bay and Port Townsend will not produce the moral effect upon these northern Indians, which they do upon the Indians residing in their immediate neighborhood. These Indians can approach without being seen at either station, hastily destroying what they do not carry off 
and can disappear without a trace by which to pursue them. The settlers believe themselves to be very much exposed should it be convenient for a US naval vessel to cruise among the islands north of this place and occasionally anchor in Penn's Cove, it would give a feeling of security to the inhabitants of that island. So that was 1856. I don't have to tell you that his request was not answered and, and the Isaac Eby paid the price for that. So there really was no Navy here. Um, when you saw there were revenue cutters, uh, basically the forerunner of the Coast Guard, uh, and there was the USS Massachusetts, which was a naval vessel, but it was captained by civilian crew and Haller's men were the Marines that were um, floating all over Puget Sound, uh, trying to stop Northern Indian pirates from attacking ships and villages. Um, they were all over, they followed India, uh, Northern Indians into, into um, uh, up towards Bellingham into Elliott Bay um, and uh, all around the San Juan Islands. So uh, they were not on the ship during the Port Gamble incident, by the way, that was uh, others, but Haller spent a lot of time on this vessel. Um, he was on the vessel during the pig war, during the San Juan Island boundary dispute. So these graphics, which I pilfered from the park service up there, um, show show the soldiers digging in this would have been 1859 and then the graphic shows down below shows the two british warships um in griffin bay and or garrison wait is it garrison bay it's griffin bay um and then um the uss massachusetts on the other side of of the peninsula and that is where haller spent uh the most uh, um nail biting time of the war trying to back up Pickett's men who were on land. So he's really got a hand in everything. He's got a hand in uh, skirmishes with Eastern Indians, uh, with Northern Indians, with the Brits. Um, and in fact, uh, there's evidence that when he was stationed at Fort Townsend that he was brought in on at least one occasion to stop a lynching of a, um, of a Sklala man. Uh, so he did intervene in uh, issues, conflicts with native peoples uh, in Port Townsend as well. So he's got Coast Salish, Eastern and Northern and the Brits. He's really our champion of, of all five uh, cultures that are converging here. So uh, yeah, I'm, I went right through the Civil War. That's another story. Um, that's a whole presentation in itself. Um, he served in the Union Army. Um, had a little issue with the Secretary of War who figured out that he wasn't a big supporter of Abraham Lincoln and basically dismissed him as a potential traitor uh, from the army. And uh, so he, while the Civil War was still going on, he came back uh, as a civilian to settle on Whidbey Island and uh, was pretty instrumental in starting things, uh, not just politically uh, as a uh, the first Grand Master of the Masonic Lodge, as the postmaster, as the county treasurer. But uh, he was, in a way, uh, old man Potter. He had a lot of money. Well, I should say his wife had a lot of money. And while they had been stationed out here, they did a lot of uh, land grabbing, as everybody was doing, uh, because it was free or cheap everywhere. And, um, and so he was a private banker. He's, he uh, lent money to just about everybody uh, and made a killing. So women of the house are really interesting too. They have a much quieter story. Henrietta was really the, um, the financial brains of the family. Haller was the soldier, but Henrietta was the money manager. Um, there is a, uh, a lot of evidence that the uh, real estate investments that made them so wealthy were made by her. Um, their niece, Nellie Moore uh, Coop, uh, after she got married, uh, she was Haller's niece, who Haller had paid to be educated in Baltimore so that she could come out, live with them, and educate his four children, which is what she did. Uh, she ended up uh, with Haller's older daughters um, opening up a school, uh, and people came, sent their kids from as far away as Bellingham to go to Miss Moore's school. She married Thomas Coop's son, and they moved up to Whatcom, and she became the first um, superintendent of uh, Whatcom County Schools.
So she uh, and the two uh, daughters, Haller's two daughters, were both uh, educators in the um, Island County Schools. Emma Coots, we don't have, well, I do have, I, somebody did send me a picture of Emma Coots, but as a very, very elderly woman, I was a teenage girl. She was, um, her father was a, a sheriff in Bellingham and her mother was a native woman. So she's really um, representative of the many, um, the many native women um, and the offspring who married uh, white men and their, and their children how they survived, how they helped build the territory um, and what their roles were and their problems were. So we have um, a lot of different female, uh, stories of women to tell out of the house as well. So um, as most of you know, where we are, we see ourselves, um, once we finally open the Haller House up as a, a heritage site, um, we see that whole green space between Front Street and 9th Street acting as a kind of bookend to the museum and the wharf, um, really framing our historic downtown district um, uh, with great symmetry. We've got lots of surviving material culture in the house. Uh, it doesn't look like this anymore because the house has been gutted, but all the good stuff that we can reuse is being reused. Um, all the doors in the house were faux grain painted to look like a more exotic wood, uh, which was pretty common in the 19th century. And uh, all the uh, we have so much uh, hardware. I don't know if you can make it out on your screens, but this is a really great um, molded iron um, escutcheon uh, with a, what appears to be either a Greek or a Roman wo woman walking in her garden. Um, and then uh, we are legendary for our bazillions of layers of wallpaper. Uh, so even though we have gutted and pulled off lath and plaster um, wherever the, the wallpaper was, we did save one piece, one place where we, fr we left the plaster intact and we, we um, revealed the layers of wallpaper there. So if you're at all into the material culture of the house, you'll still be able to see all, all six layers of uh, wallpaper in the west parlor. Um, the East Parlor will um, <laughs> look a whole lot better than this <laughs> when we're done with it. Um, there had been a fire in there, so it didn't retain much, including the mantle was gone. Um, but the fire didn't take the house down and uh, uh, really wonderful 11 foot ceilings, uh, two bay windows to let light in. And that's where our primary um, uh, exhibits about the, um, the territorial era uh, in our in our uh, state will uh, be in there. I think we're gonna, uh, in the other parlor, the one with all the wallpaper, I think that we're gonna be focusing on architectural history in there. Uh, it's a smaller parlor. The bigger parlor will have more room for um, settlement history. And um, part of that will be also, we've already talked to Emily Washings of the Yakima of having space for Yakima interpretation of the Yakima Wars. and. If we're lucky, we'll be able to get the Coast Salish to allow us or to provide us with um, their own perspectives on on uh, what was going on in Penn Cove uh, during this period. So some of you already know the back part of the building, the old Bruin cabin, is going to be have some major changes in it. That's where our mercantile store and Victorian soda fountain will be. Um, that will be the way we uh, the house is self-sustaining hopefully we will make enough money in our commercial uh, space to support the maintenance of the house and that is a picture of the um the back bar for our fountain that we have in storage and uh, now all we need is a really good uh, marble and brass uh, uh, fountain like on the right we don't have it but uh, that's what that's what yard sales are for right if you know of any <laughs> let us know and then of course the gardens you know as you know walking by it looks like must a missile testing site but um we we will be um returning the grounds to um uh, a period appropriate garden the way henrietta would have uh, would have arranged them so some of the projects we finished over the last few years since we bought it in 2018 new roof 
We have taken down the chimney uh, and fireplaces all the way to the ground and rebuilt them with um, original brick as much as possible. Um, and then um, the only part that we haven't finished yet is uh, above the roof. We've got all the way up to the roof and are waiting for um, the perfect weather for the mason to get out there and put our beautiful double arched chimney back up. Um, we lifted the house, we put a foundation under it. Um, it used to have wood skirting uh, around the crawl space, uh, now has concrete skirting that has been molded to look like wood skirting. Uh, we've rebuilt the porches and uh, redone the rehabbed all the original windows. So when you come in, you'll see all the bubbles and the waves. Uh, miraculously, they lost very few window panes over the last 150 years. Uh, and so uh, once again, we're going to be having beautiful views out our bay windows. So um, that is primarily um, the story of uh, the Howlers and the house we're trying to save uh, and their stories. So if you got any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Wonderful. Thank you so, so much, Lynn. You're welcome. I did mute everyone just because there was a little feedback there. So if you do have questions, feel free to unmute yourself and, and let Lynn know. Terry. Thank you. Lynn, a question. What was Heller's stance on the Civil War? Heller was a, he was a preserve the union kind of guy. Um, uh, he was not, um, I wouldn't go so far as to call him a Confederate sympathizer, but he was not an abolitionist. And um, he had served uh, for the first three years or the first two and a half years um, directly uh, um, under uh, General McClellan. So if you're familiar at all with McClellan's um, tenure, uh, he he was a, appears to have been a really great general for building an army, but kind of, um, <laughs> <laughs> didn't like it to get too dirty. <laughs> so so uh, Lincoln uh, fired him twice. And uh, in the end, he ended up running against Lincoln for re-election in the 1864 presidential election. So um, it, it, was, it was widely feared by um, Lincoln's cabinet, especially the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, that um, a disgruntled McClellan was... Um, was uh, orchestrating a military coup of the administration. And so there were quite a number of officers under McClellan who were um, rounded up and tossed without court martials, without hearings um, out of the army just to be safe. And that was what happened to Haller. Um, it was, uh, it was um, we, we actually have a letter from McClellan to Haller um, because McClellan was booted out of the army before Haller was um, expressing his sympathy and knowing that Haller could never have been disloyal. Um, but of course, as you may know, uh, Haller spent the 16 years that he lived in the Haller house or in on Whidbey, I should say, um, trying to get a court martial, you know, hounding his, uh, his, his uh, representatives in Congress until he finally was able to get um, a court martial and he was uh, exonerated at that time. So uh, he was uh, returned to the army uh, and was uh, given the rank of colonel, which is what he uh, would have been if he had not been dismissed, uh, the minimum of what he would have been if he hadn't been dismissed. So um, if that's when they left Whidbey, when they left uh, Coopville was when he was stationed down in, in the Southwest uh, to finish out his military career there. I've got two quick restoration questions. Yeah. Will you do, uh, in the interior, will you do drywall or lap and plaster? What is? So we are gonna do um, drywall. Okay. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is the, um, the engineers were um, insistent that for seismic stability, the perimeter interior walls needed to be um, uh, sheathed with plywood for stability, um, which takes took up a lot of depth in the wall, which would make the walls not 
in the proper relation to all the, you know, the windows and the doors and all that stuff. So um, uh, the other is, is that um, there have been no systems in the house, you know, no plumbing, no wiring, none of that. And so because the plaster was in such bad shape in many places, we just decided that since the walls in the Haller house would all be uh, covered with wallpaper anyway, that uh, it was just wise to take it all out, get the sheathing up and, you know, get the systems in drywall. And then, uh, because we can use quarter inch drywall. Sure. So that will, the half inch plywood and the quarter inch drywall will be the same depth as the lath and plaster was. And do you, do you know what the exterior, the original, the original exterior, exterior color was? With sanding down through the layers of paint because uh, especially on the Haller, the Haller house uh, um, clabbered is all original. Um, we've got down to a wheat gold um, and the trim is something of a butterscotch. I think the first few years of the house based on those photographs I showed you, the trim was white, but um, by the time they put the conservatory window up, the trim had all gotten darker than the base color of the house. So the windows are still white, but there'll be kind of a, a darker a butterscotch and then kind of a wheat gold for the color. It's going to look like a very different house. Yeah. And hopefully yeah. that will happen this year. Good. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Crickets. <laughs> Carol may have something. Hope you're still muted. Carol, if you're trying to say something, you're still muted. Is that working? Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. Are there sources uh, to read about Henrietta Haller, or is there just not stuff written about her? There are. There's stuff that's written about her, but not much of it is published. So oh, okay. um, it's not a lot. There uh -huh. is, um, I, you know, I don't know if you can still find it. I can send it to you if, um, if I can find it. But there was a, an old issue of Columbia Magazine. That's the yeah. magazine of the S Washington State Historical Society. Yeah. It was uh, excerpts from uh, letters that the family has of hers. Mm -hmm. And um, so there are le letter, there was that that was published. I think that's the only thing that was published. I think I have um, uh, like uh, an essay that was written but never published about, um, about her, perhaps by one of the descendants of the family. Yeah. But I'm, I'm happy to send you what I have. It's a lot of it is old typewriter paper. Yeah, that's <laughs> fine. <laughs> Sometimes you get the best information from those. <laughs> yeah. One thing I'd love to, I found it and I, I didn't think of it or I would have um, put it up on the slide. Um, I found uh, the Wilhites, who were the last family to live in the house, um, were pretty interested in the, in the history of the house. And they gave me a packet of old deeds so that I could try to trace how the property got you know, short platted and who owned it when and why are there so many weird pieces of property there. And, um, and in the middle of it, there was basically what looked like a legal declaration by Henrietta that um, the property that she owned was her property, hers alone, and not the colonel's. <laughs> so the whole basis of the, of the thing was just to let everybody know, I'm not just his wife, yeah, yeah. I am my own girl. <laughs> yeah, that's the impression I've had, but I can't find it to prove it. <laughs> Interesting. Did I, if you got a, it might be that, um, you know, when I sent out the newsletter in yeah. December, the, uh, there might be a picture of it on that. I'll look. Look yeah. for that. I think I actually included it in that. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Briggs, you are also muted. <laughs> I apologize, guys. That's okay. I, I did that like an hour ago, so I totally, well, I forget <laughs> things I did five minutes ago, so. But, um, is there a reading list or something for some of us newer 
members here of the group. Um, and also, um, Lynn, I, I really am not, I mean, I've only lived on the island for 10 years, so I'm kind of a newbie here, but um, I'm not all that familiar with your work. And, uh, you know, have you written any books or anything on this? Is that, yeah, is Lynn, where's you your book? I've written at least one, one book just based on what you uh, have elaborated here today, you know. You know, if I could, if I were independently wealthy, the bookshelves would be full of my books. <laughs> but, but um, yeah, I, um, there's a book in my head. I just haven't got it on paper yet. Um, so the, the books, the books that um, I recommend, well, first of all, I know that, um, for any of you who've had a chance, haven't had a chance to look at Doug Doerr's um, ethno history, there's no, I mean, it's the best thing there is anywhere about the Skagit of Penn Cove. And it, of course you can't be talking about the Skagit of Penn Cove without what they were going through with the settlement and the Penn Cove Indian Agency. So the, that used to be something you could get online as a PDF. Um, but my understanding is, is that it's been pulled because he's actually rewriting it to publish a book for general readership. Um, oh. Those academic studies tend to be pretty dry. So if and when that comes out, and I'm, I have no doubt it'll be available at the Island County Historical Museum the moment it is, um, that's a really good one for, uh, especially for Native. Um, there's a, um, I think it's called a Territorial Washington. Yeah. Um, is a good one. Robert Ficken, um, uh, the Richard White book on Island County has a lot of good stuff in it. Um, the, um, you know, the truth is, is there's not um, any one singular book that really helps you. Uh, I find, uh, especially for the pig war, Mike Vorey's book, um, uh, what is it? A Standoff at Griffin Bay. Uh, is really good, not just for the pig war, but also he talks quite a lot. Nobody knows more about um, Northern Indians, the Raiders than Mike Vorey. And part of that is in that book. And then, um, and I can send you all links. There's, he did, a, he did a couple of articles for Columbia Magazine as well. And you can download them off their site. Um, a really, um, really wonderful and informative um, article about the Northern Raiders in there. And I think it was 1997. I, I read a, the book on the pig wars when I first moved here uh -huh. years ago. Yeah, I still have it somewhere around here. Yeah, he's, um, uh, he's, um, he was started out as a journalist, but he ended up working for the National Park Service and he worked at San Juan for 20 years. So nobody, I worked under him just before he retired. And uh, I mean, he's just a walking encyclopedia. I would really like to get him down here to do a talk. Um, there's a book uh, on uh, Isaac Stevens, if you can stand it, called um, <laughs> Isaac, <laughs> Isaac Stevens. <laughs> he's such a little ne'er-do-well. Um, uh, young man in a hurry. Kent, um, oh my God. Young man in a hurry, I'll get you there. Um, they're, they'll come to me slowly after I'm done talking. Well, that's fine. I said, this is enough to get me going. You yeah, know. it'll get you going. Um, oh. And of course, the old guys, you know, like the Ezra Meeker, um, the, the, the eyewitnesses of settlement. I, Ezra Meeker's a pioneer. Oh, Ezra Meeker and um, Clarence Bagley. Um, those are guys that wrote in the 19th century, but they're chock full of information, even if they are chock full of bias. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm a, I'm a uh, southerner here, down here in uh, Green Bank, you know. Uh -huh. I'm not really a Coopville-ite, <laughs> so. But I sure, I sure love the town. It's sure beautiful. I love going up there and yeah. hanging out. And I'm, I'll be honest, I, I'm a little embarrassed, but I can't believe all the buildings uh, that are, have been at least acknowledged in Coopville. You know, I grew up in the Monterey Bay area and uh, I remember as a kid going to Monterey and going on the, um, the walk 
you'd walk around or the drive or something. I forget what it was called, but you could walk from Robert Louis Stevenson's house to somebody else's house. And, you know, and someday if we, I would say this would be a big goal for the next century, maybe <laughs> to be cool to have a walkway around Coopville, yeah. you know, with some signage and stuff like that. Oh, and then, yeah. And then all the houses had, um, tours, you know, Robert Louis yeah. Stevenson's house and all that stuff. So. Yeah, it's, uh, I spent a few years in um, Concord, Massachusetts, working in old historic houses, um, Ralph Waldo Emerson's home, Nathaniel Hawthorne's home. Um, and for the most part, um, historic houses have a really hard time financially. You know, they're not in vogue anymore. You have to find something else to do with them. That's why we're putting the mercantile in the Haller house. Um, luckily, the Ferry House and the EB House, we don't have to do that because the Park Service doesn't need to run at a profit with them. Um, but as we look at other places that um, uh, that are um, important to save and that the public would love to get into, whether it's the Coop House or the, um, the county courthouse down in uh, Coveland, um, or even the Engel Farmhouse, um, it's... <sighs> to open them up as, as uh, to the public, it's got to have another gig attached to it. And, uh, and we know that the park service is not in the business of acquiring property. They, <laughs> they just go, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to give them the Haller house once they wouldn't take it. <laughs> well, well, my background's in uh, nonprofits and educational centers. I ran a big, um, uh, education center down in Orange County for 22 years oh, wow. oh, and uh, so I understand all the finances behind it and then in my youth I wrote books for us so when you mentioned having to be wealthy to publish books I get that the market is so small you know that you can't you either have to have it fully funded or somebody you know pay for the whole thing up front right. uh, to have it even be you know I wrote for the dive industry, which is a I think oh, really? would be a large, but my books, it's I had some of the best selling books in the industry, but they they would they didn't support me, you know. Right. right. So um, I get the, I get a lot of this. I I just I don't know, your imagination. I love you know the thing I loved about working in a nonprofit for a nonprofit is that that it was just full of dreamers, you know, a lot of people all dreaming. And I can see a lot of dreamers here on this, on this uh, computer, uh, just thinking about, you know, how cool all these places are in Hoopville and what we could possibly do with them. And, you know, and that's half the fun of it. It's just the dreaming, you know? Yeah. Well, it's the dreamers who make sure they, these places aren't torn down and built over. Um, so we're, we may not be a success in the financial world, but uh, at right. least we left something better than we found it, right? Absolutely. But Lynn, I have to tell you, if it wasn't for your tenacity, we wouldn't have the Heller House, so thank you. Just a quick, this is off the off subject, but is there any update with the, Zel, the Zelstra law? Zelstra, it's, it's uh, no, I don't think so. I know that um, <laughs> I just got an email from Rick at the museum because he had, he had contacted uh, Nickel Brothers, the house movers, right. to see what it would cost to try to relocate that house. 